How to use networking to double your business on today's episode. Today's episode is brought to you by ConvertKit, the ultimate list building, tagging, and segmentation tool. To find out how ConvertKit can change your business and double your profits, go to servedomaster.com backslash ConvertKit today. Are you tired of dealing with your boss? Do you feel underpaid and underappreciated? If you want to make it online, fire your boss and start living your retirement dreams now. Then you've come to the right place. Welcome to Serve No Master Podcast, where you'll learn how to open new revenue streams and make money while you sleep. Presented live from a tropical island in the South Pacific by best-selling author Jonathan Green. Now, here's your host. With the completion and launch of my new product, Networking Empire, which really covers one of the critical components of online business and one of the pieces that's really missing, I thought I would share some of the best lessons and some of the key content with you as a reward for being one of my podcast listeners. As you know, I don't always feel it's critical to hide all my information behind a pay gate. So I want to share some stuff with you that I think is really special. And what I'm going to do is go through some specific examples today of things you could want to accomplish and how you can use networking and some of the networking tools to accomplish them. There's a lot of information about networking, a lot of level one networking stuff covered in the Serve No Master book. So if you're really looking to first learn about networking, that's a great place to start. And then the course, of course, Networking Empire, I'm very proud of, covers some really advanced stuff and will help you double or triple your income very, very quickly because networking is not a replacement for the other tasks that we cover. It's not a replacement for starting a podcast. It's not a replacement for becoming a really good writer or becoming a really good affiliate marketer. What it is is an accelerator. So let's say, for example, you're an affiliate marketer. You're recommending products and every product you recommend, they pay you 50%. That's pretty nice. When you use these networking techniques and when you become familiar with the people who actually run those platforms, they'll bump your commission up and they'll go, oh, you're doing so much for us. Let us put you at 70, 80, or 90%. For some offers, I put people at 90%. And in fact, in the past, I put people at 100% and paid people 100% of every sale they generate. These little moves, these little decisions can really make a big difference for your business. So if you're promoting someone and they bump you from 50 to 70%, wow, that's pretty nice. That's a 40% pay rise. It's really going to make a difference on your bottom line. So even though you haven't changed anything, you haven't changed how, many tra- how much traffic you're sending, how many sales you're making, you're making more money. It's like getting an instant raise. And it's one of many, many ways networking can really help you. If you're struggling with your podcast, you can get a ton of great interviews. You can get lots and lots of really, really good guests on your podcast. And then those guests following listen to your podcast and suddenly you have a bigger and bigger audience. One of the best and easiest ways to grow your audience is to do lots and lots and lots and lots of interviews. That's why most big podcasts have an interview every single day. That's not the direction I chose to go in because I really like sharing my own information. But I am thinking about you know, increasing from one to having two or even three interviews a month. So I am thinking about bringing in a few more cool interviews and I have a few I'm planning on doing over the next few months. But when you're growing any type of business, the more contacts you have, the more connected they are, the more things can happen. So the first example today is let's say you're a screenwriter in Los Angeles or you could be a playwright in New York and this works in either case. And you want to get your script in front of people that will actually make a difference. This is one of the hardest things to do, and in fact, I listen to the podcast by script writers, and their advice about how to get found is, I would say, probably completely garbage, because they basically say, oh, it's different for everyone. So they constantly talk about how it totally depends upon luck, how you have to be a great writer, you have to put in all this work, and then just hope something good comes your way. I think right now in America, there are 5,000 working writers, or maybe it's 5,000 working movie writers. So it's not that many people in the business at all. They're actually making a living from it. Those are people that are in the union. And it's very interesting to listen to people talk about it. And all these people, you know, they're up on their high tower and they've each written, you know, three or four or five movies. And it's like, oh, you know, if you want to get good at it, good luck. And I understand they, are, they really understand the part about writing great scripts. Their understanding of story and script is very, very strong, way stronger than mine. And that's why I listen. I love learning about story. If you want to learn how to tell good stories, if you want to learn about story for your sales letters, for your audience, it's much better to follow a storytelling book than it is to follow a copywriting book. Because in a movie, the story is everything. If a movie doesn't have a good story or if a movie makes a mistake in the hero's journey, then that's everything. The story is destroyed. So it's really, really valuable to go to other sources. It's very traditional, in, especially in copywriting and a few other areas of this market too. Simply go to someone who's good at exactly what you want to learn. But you want to go to where they learned. 
So if you want to learn to write, write really good stories, if you want to learn fiction stories I've talked about in the past, I really love the book uh, Pants Off Outlining. But if you want to get even better than the lady who wrote that book, you can go to the books. She tells you which books she read first to really learn more and more about story. So we always want to go to the source. But to circle back, I know I've gone down a little bit of a rabbit hole. You're a scriptwriter in LA, a screenwriter, and you want to make that connection. Here's how you can do it and get your script read by a serious producer in the next 60 days. If you follow these steps, it will change your life. Now, it's really a question of implementation, but let me tell you exactly what you do. Number one, you find a popular hangout for producers and directors. And I happen to know one in LA. I only know one because my friend went to this exact bar, and I've actually been to it as well a few times, and so I know it's true. What you want to find is an intersection. See, there are several different types of trendy bars, and the more you understand if you live in LA, hopefully you do. The more you understand the way different bars and different nightclubs work, the better. What you want to find is a place that has a couple of key elements. Number one, it's not too loud. If you go to a place that's super loud the entire time and no one can really communicate, like a lot of nightclubs are, a lot of VIP nightclubs are so loud you can't talk to strangers, you won't be able to make this happen. Number two, you want a place that's open hours where it's not very crowded. So you want a place that's open usually throughout the day is ideal. And you want a place where the elite and the norms intersect. There are certain venues in Los Angeles that are crazy expensive and they're only for high level actors who want to be left alone. And I totally get that. So to build up to the level where you can get access to those venues, you'd have to go through my entire networking empire course and spend six months on it. You can totally do it. I've done it. I used to hang out at this venue in London with, where the actors would go. A venue that costs a quarter million dollars a year to be a member. Just to be a member, that means you have to pay that much money to be allowed to go there and spend money. And I used to walk in for free and this place doesn't have a sign. You either know about it or you don't. And so I certainly know how to get access to those types of places, but that takes a long time. What you want is a 60-day plan. And you know there's certain places in LA where regular people and people that are a little bit more of a celebrity, oftentimes they're celebrities that people don't recognize. You know, well-known writers, well-known directors, well-known producers can hang out there because no one knows what they look like, so no one will bother them. These are places that are really cool, and oftentimes they're places that have just been around for a long time. And so actors have been hanging out there for 40, 50, 60 years, so there's a bit of a tradition. You, once you've chosen your location, once you've completed step one and said, this is the bar I'm going to use because it's a place where regular people interact with directors, producers, and it's a place I can gain access to. So these are the elements we've looked at. Once you've chosen this place, once you've chosen this location, your job is to go there when it's empty. This is why we want a place that's not open all the time. So step two, go there when it's empty. Go there when it's not crowded. This is why going to a raw nightclub is tough because nightclubs open at 10, close at 4. There's not really a time when it's empty. You don't really have the chance to do what you need to do, but a place that has a lunchtime situation or a place that opens early in the afternoon. Many bars, I used to go to a nightclub when I was in college that opened at like seven o'clock, but no one showed up till 11. So if you have that type of window, you can work with that. And in New York, there's tons of places like this. It's even easier than LA. In London, it's really, really easy, but you wanna find places where really cool people or the people that you want to interact with will hang out at some point. So you go there when it's empty and you begin to form a relationship with everyone who works there. And you begin by simply treating everyone well, learning everyone's name, learning one fact about them. Learn a little something interesting about each person. And when you learn a little something about everyone, you could begin to form a connection. You begin to develop a reputation. You go to this place over and over again when it's empty. You go there all the time when it's empty and you become their favorite person when it's empty. And you develop these relationships by being friendly with them, telling stories to them, learning something about them, asking them questions. When you find out someone's son's name, the next time you see him, say, how's your son Tommy? How's Tommy doing? So once you learn a piece of insider knowledge, you demonstrate it. And this is about forming a relationship with everyone who works there. From the bartenders to the bouncers to the barbacks to the bathroom attendant. All of those people are very, very critical to your success. And when you form a strong relationship with all of these people, when they all know your name and you know their name and one fact about each of them, you've begun to develop a reputation for yourself and you always, always, always drink one drink. I let it be known that I drink white Russians. There's no secret about that. It's known that that's my drink. Anywhere I go, I lock in and you have to do that. If you go there and you want those people wants to experiment, have a different drink every single time, then this technique will start to fail. Please stick to the script if you want to be a famous writer, if you want to be successful. This is what you have to do. What happens when you order the same drink over and over again, people get used to it. And when you walk in, they start making it. They go, oh, there's White Russian Jonathan. Now before, at a bar I used to use in London, it was a tequila sunrise and your drink can be different, whatever. But once you pick one drink, lock into it. And you want to choose something that you know, they have to make is even better because then people seem having to make it. You walk in. When I used to walk into my, one of my bars in London, I would just hold up one finger for one tequila sunrise, two fingers for two. I didn't have to say a word. And when people see you do that, when people see you walk into a bar and you hold up a finger and they immediately start making your drink, they go, holy crap, this person's important. 
See all those movie producers and directors that think they're so cool and they're dropping thousands and millions of dollars in this bar? They order different drinks all the time. So they can't do that. When you do that, you're doing something they don't know how to do. You're demonstrating you've accomplished something that they haven't accomplished because money doesn't make that happen. Money doesn't affect memory enough. So you're beginning to build up a little bit of cachet. Now that you have your regular locked in, now that everyone knows you, you what I want you to do is start going there when it's crowded. You go into the place when it's the coolest time of the night and now because everyone knows you, because you've built up a little bit of your reputation, you go in when it's crowded and you walk right through the door. The bouncer goes, hey Jonathan, what's going on? No cover for you. We know exactly who you are. Please cut the entire line. And I use those words because they've been said to me many, many, many times. If you've seen my pictures, and I'm sure you have, I don't look like the type of person that gets to cut lines because I'm not. It's not my looks. It's not my wealth. I cut more lines when I was broke than I ever did when I started making money online. Money doesn't do anything compared to social connection. Bribing your way into a bar, yeah, you can give the bouncer a tip, but it's nothing compared to when the bouncer knows you and you've earned a relationship. Ten times more valuable, ten times more leverage. So building that connection, building that leverage, will allow you to walk into the bar and then you walk in and you order your regular. People see that happening. And then you're talking to the bartender, you're talking to everyone who works there. And then the bartender introduces you to the night bartenders you haven't met before and they introduce you to the manager. And the manager goes, wow, how do you know everyone here? And you go, I just like talking to people. And they go, wow, that's so cool. And you start talking to the manager. And again, you use your principles, you use your connection principles, you use your value giving technique, and you form a relationship with the manager or the owner of this really high end bar. Now, this person's phone book has every single person that you could ever want in it because they run the cool bar, they run this cool hotspot. And it, you can do the same thing for cafes or whatever, any type of business you can do this. You can do this at a yoga studio. You can do this anywhere you want. But this is for if someone wants to be a successful screenwriter, you follow this technique and you go to these really cool places and you form these relationships. And now this person will sit, be talking to you and go, oh, do you know so-and-so? And they'll introduce you to the director you've always dreamed of working with. Now here's where it's absolutely critical that you don't screw this up. Don't immediately hand them your script because you'll burn the bridge to the ground and they'll, they'll probably throw you out of the place. All you do is continue what you're doing and form the relationship. Now the person will ask you what you do and they'll say, oh, what do you do? And this is the moment where you can make this work or you can make this fail. What you say is, and this is so critical, please listen carefully, you go, oh, I'm a writer, but I don't really come here to talk about work. What do you like to do when you're not working? What do you do besides working? I know I don't want to talk about movie stuff if that's okay. What do you love to do? The second you say that, the second you deflect that conversation, you'll become a Hollywood screenwriter. You'll change your destiny. That's the moment where you have a chance to change everything. Because see, every other screenwriter, when they meet that person, will go, oh, I'm a writer. Do you want to read my script? And when you say, I don't need your help. I would rather get to know you. I'd rather form a real connection. The person goes, wow, this person's real. This person must be an amazing writer if they don't need me to read their script, right? If they're not begging me to read their script, they must be amazing. <laughs> because when we reject people, that's when they really want it, isn't it? So now they'll actually want to read it. And you go, look, if you want to read it sometime, yeah, I'll show it to you some other time. But I'd really rather, if that's okay with you, I'd rather just talk to you and get to know you. I'd rather meet you as a person. I'm here to hang out and have a nice time. It's my time off. I'm not really in the office, if you know what I mean. See, that's the mindset of the elite, isn't it? That's how people act. Most people, for me, if someone walks up to me and I'm hanging out with my friends and they want to ask writing advice, I'm like, oh, it's not the right time. Can you ask me when I'm, not a, when I'm at work rather than when I'm in a social situation? So by acting the same way, you're demonstrating excellence. And you're doing a million subcommunications that all will make people treat you differently. They'll be like, wow, finally a writer who isn't trying to shove a script under my nose. How nice is that? And then they'll introduce you to other directors. Go, and you'll suddenly be sitting there with three directors who've all won Academy Awards. And they're going, he's going, you got to meet this, you got to meet this guy, you got to meet this gal. This girl, this writer, she didn't even, I asked to read her script and she said no. She said, she said she's here to hang out. We've never met a writer like that. We've got to have shots together. And suddenly you'll be hanging out with directors who love you simply because you act like an adult and you aren't trying to shove your work up their noses. This is how, in 60 days or less, you can be hanging out with the top directors in Hollywood, swapping numbers, and then when it is work time, when it's a separate time, right, after you've built this relationship later on, they'll ask you to see your script again. You're going, okay, since you've asked, I'll show it to you. But I'd rather, you know, I like to keep business and friendship separate. I'm happy to show it to you and like you look at it as a friend and you've asked it, but I want to be sure that this isn't, this isn't going to affect our friendship. When you say stuff like that, it's very powerful. And suddenly, even though you haven't written a movie that anyone's read yet or produced or anything yet, you're hanging out with these high level directors. And guess what? When other actors and other writers see you hanging out with those directors, your social currency, your social value, your perception goes through the roof. People will think you're a seriously, massively successful writer because you're hanging out with the people that successful writers hang out. 
and now you're beginning to create a reputation. All you've done is follow my simple formula. This is a very simple and powerful strategy. Let's go in another direction. Okay, that's example number one. Let's say you work at a steel mill and you're tired of working the floor. Your back is killing you. You're hitting your late 40s. You've been pushing that steel press for decades and it's ripping you to pieces. Every day after work, you work in the factory, you go out with the other factory workers, you guys have drinks and you talk about how much you hate management, right? It's normal. I used to have a friend who worked in a, I've never worked in a factory. It's one of the few jobs I've ever had, but one of my friends used to work in a factory making cars. And they're very much driven by their unions. All factories are. My uncle was a big union guy. He was a dock working union, but still, he was, union was his number one love. When you work in this type of job, there's a big line between the workers and management. Workers hate management, of course. It's how every business is, right? But it's really delineated at most of this type of industry. So you've spent the last 10 or 20 years really building up that relationship with the guys around you, the guys at the same level as you. The problem is none of them has the power to make you a manager. So if you want to move off the floor, you want to move into a non-physical job, you want to then be a management guy so you can represent your friends, here's a few key simple steps you can take. You want to begin changing your external reputation. This means that you need to be able to hang out in social settings with management instead of other workers. Now, I don't want you to think you have to immediately go hang out with your managers because you don't. What we're gonna do is call it an oblique strike, a surprise attack. We're gonna sneak up on these managers. So find out where managers from other factories or other places hang out that are not where your managers hang out. This is step one. And you're gonna study how these nerds hang out with each other. You're gonna observe how do they dress, what do they talk about, what are the things they're interested in. See, maybe you're really into football, but they're really into golf. Well, guess what? You're gonna learn a little bit about golf. When I used to hang out with all football guys, when I was surrounded by management who liked football, guess what? I started watching the games when I went home because I knew it was critical information. You want to be in a position where you can start having non-work conversations with people that have the ability to change your destiny. Now, when you're thinking about where to hang out, when you're thinking about how high to leverage yourself, I don't want you to just limit yourself to your boss. Instead, think about his boss or the boss above him. Where does the guy who runs your entire factory hang out? Where do guys like that spend time? Now again, it's very tempting to immediately go, oh, it's somewhere really expensive. It doesn't have to be. That's a misconception and it's flawed. There's a lot of places that very wealthy people hang out that are very cheap. Anywhere from a Jamba Juice to the public golf course to where their kids play soccer. There are a lot of places where you can begin to intersect with people in high level management. And in fact, let's imagine, let's go a little bit outside the box. I don't want to tell another bar story. We've already done the bar example. You know what to do in a bar. But let's say, simple example, you find out that the owner of your company, his kid is playing soccer and his kid's the same age as yours, okay? If you can and your kids play soccer as well, you put them in the same league. Now, that might not be a possibility. So another thing that you can do, you know, if you can join this network, let's assume you have a kid that's soccer age, right? So you bring your kid and your kid starts playing soccer and instead of having your kid play soccer in the poor league, you simply move into the league across town so that you start to have access to a different group of parents and you just continue to focus on building your social connections. Whenever they need a parent to volunteer and bring the juice with the lemon wedges or the orange wedges, whenever they need a place or a truck to drive the kids around to a pizza party, you're always there. You become the dad or the mom who steps up in this group. All the other parents, right? they leverage their money because they can afford to hire all the things they need, but you're not there yet. You become the person who's always there. So suddenly, your kid's on a soccer team with all wealthy parents, and rather than you being intimidated by those parents, you simply fit in because you let go of that. Who cares? Because you're gonna become one of them within the next six months. As you build this reputation, as your kid begins to play against other teams, other teams, eventually your kid will play against the team that your owner, the owner of your business, his kid's on the team which means he's gonna be at one of the games on the opposite side of the field. But now you've spent so long building up your reputation, you've taken the time to implement this strategy, which means you've developed a relationship with everyone on the field. All of the coaches in the league know you and have respect for you because you're kind to them. You know every kid on your team's name. You know their parents' names. You know one fact about each of them. You know the favorite subject of every kid or the favorite TV show of every kid. You know something. You become someone who learns a particular fact about all the kids you meet. All the referees know you, and they know that when they need an extra line person, and they always do, they always need that extra line ref, that you're willing to do it. You have a reputation as someone who gets things done and who doesn't complain when other people need help, that you step up. And because you understand and you work in a factory, you understand how to do physical things. So when someone needed a jump two weeks ago, you gave them the jump. And so you're now known as the hero who gave someone a jump because the only one knows how to use jumper cables. Plenty of wealthy people, managers, you know, they don't know how to do anything. 
they have jumper cables in their cars, but they don't know how to use them. They don't know where to connect them. So these little things that you do that you've always thought weren't valuable, suddenly you become the one person, the one blue collar in a sea of white. See, when you're at your traditional bar, when you're hanging out with the other blue collar guys, yeah, you're not special. But here, you're special because you know how to do the things that these people don't know how to do. And people see you as the great dad or the great mom who's really stepped up. And you built this strong reputation. So it's finally the game. And you can see that the owner of your entire factory, the owner of your business, perhaps the owner of 17 factories is across the field from you. And you look around the field and you realize that you're there with all of your allies. See, a bunch of the parents on your team know the parents on the other teams. And you say, hey, can you introduce me to the people on the other team? I, you know, I love meeting everyone else in the field. And so they'll walk over to the other team, right, after the game or maybe at lunch. And they'll go, hey, guys, how are going on? Do you know this? This is parent, you know, this is Jonathan, his kid joined our team six months ago. This guy's awesome. He's this, this, and this. And you're meeting all the parents on the other team, and eventually, you know, and you don't even target him, right? Eventually that owner, that CEO, that one person you're targeting, eventually that one person you're targeting walks up to you and he goes, hey, I'm Tim, who are you? And you go, oh, I'm so-and-so, it's so nice to meet you. I was just watching your kid play, he's number 17, right? And he goes, wow, how do you know? And you go, oh, I try to learn each kid and their parents. And he goes, wow, really? And you go, yeah. Number 16 is this parent. Number 17 is that you. Number 13 is this parent. And when you can demonstrate that little knowledge, you go, wow, this person's a really serious parent. I wish I was that good of a parent. Okay, so now what you've built, instead of cool value, is good parent value. And he's going to say, oh, what do you, oh, I work in a factory. And he goes, really? I work in a factory? You go, oh, wow, cool. I work in a steel mill, yada, yada. And he goes, what, really? I own that steel mill. go, oh, that's so crazy. You're a really good boss. And then you change the subject. Again, what you're not doing is pitching. You're building a relationship. You're like, look, you're, Oh, that's so cool. It's great. I hope it's okay with you, but I don't always want to talk about work here. I like to just focus on the kids. It's very tempting, right? We're surrounded by great business people. It's tempting to do business deals here. But for me, I just like to really focus on the kids and have a really good time because, you know, work stressful. You know that. Whether, you know, whether you're working in the office or you're working on the floor, it can be very stressful and it can be very hard. So what you want, I'm sure, the last thing you want to do is talk to someone who works for you about work stuff. So let's just talk about soccer stuff. How long is your kid playing soccer? Have you thought about if they're gonna go varsity or they're gonna play in high school, they're gonna try and do college soccer. And you're having this real connection and suddenly, as crazy as it sounds, your new best friend is the guy who owns your factory. And guess what happens when your best friend owns your company and is your boss? When a management position opens up and you apply within the company, right? And you apply in the normal way and he sees your name, he's gonna go, okay, here's five people that I don't know and there's one person that I really do know. And you can even leverage this for a lateral promotion. Maybe it's very difficult for you to jump to management inside your own factory. But you can say, you know, when you're hanging out at a soccer game, you walk in with a little bit of limp or something, he goes, hey, what's going on? Oh, my back hurts. You know, working physical all the time, it's really hard. I'm actually looking to move to another company. I've actually sent out some applications. I'm hoping to move into management somewhere else simply because I've been on the floor so long. And I see so many ways where I could grow the business. He says, and he'll go, well, really? Yeah, I'm pretty sure that I can increase efficiency in my old division by 3% if I was a manager. So you planted these little seeds, these little, little seeds that have turned you from someone who only hangs out with people that are at your level to people that have the ability to change your life. So these techniques, the ability to network properly, doesn't just help you if you're an independent entrepreneur. Of course it does, it's very powerful, but it can also help you. Understanding social structures can still help you even if you work in that nine to five, even if you're still trading time for money, if you're still stuck in a job you don't love. You can use your understanding to continue to leverage and push your career higher and higher. These little steps will make a huge difference and they'll allow you to open up all these new avenues. And what will happen when you follow any of these strategies is that you'll meet a lot of other people on the way and you'll go, oh, wait a minute. I thought I wanted to write movies and this person I just asked me if I'd be willing to punch up a script for a TV show. So suddenly you're a television writer. It wasn't even part of your plan. Or maybe someone asks you to help work on a play. All these little things make a huge difference. You know, you're going to all these soccer games. Your plan was to meet the owner of your factory and guess what? You met someone who owns a grocery store and he said, hey, you really have your head on your shoulders. Would you willing to manage my grocery store? I'll pay you three times that you're making right now. This is how you can go and give yourself a 100 or 200% raise in just a few months. By being tactical, by being strategical, you can make amazing things happen. Now, these are just a few of the techniques I share with you in Networking Empire, but I wanted to give you some really solid steps you could follow to actually make a difference in your life because I always want to help you have a better life. And these are some powerful ways that networking can massively increase your income and double or triple what you're making, no matter what industry you're in, in the next 60 days. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Serve No Master. Make sure you subscribe so you never miss another episode. 
We'll be back tomorrow with more tips and tactics on how to escape that rat race. Head over to servenomaster.com forward slash podcasts now for your chance to win a free copy of Jonathan's bestseller, Serve No Master. All you have to do is leave a five-star review of this podcast. See you tomorrow. Thank you for listening to the Serve No Master podcast. Email your questions to podcast at servenomaster.com and your question with my answer might appear in the next episode.